Welcome back to Endurance Icons, where we talk to athletes who are absolutely crushing it in the world of endurance sports. Today, we have the privilege of talking to Katarina Hartmut. She's a German ultra runner, and she's just coming off a second place at UTMB. Welcome. How are you doing, Katarina? Thank you. I'm doing pretty good. Amazing. Now, we were just talking before we pressed record. It sounds like you did a race the week after UTMB. Like, <laughs> is this true? Yeah, that's true. I have to admit, though, that I didn't finish the race, but it's around a long race. So, <laughs> so yeah. how did that second race feel after such an incredible performance at UTMB? Well, I also have to admit that it was not so much a race for me. I mean, that was like, well, I mean, there was only one week in between and I, I thought, well, I want to do this because it was uh, a long dream of mine to start at the Tour de Géant, mm -hmm. uh, which is a 330 kilometer race <laughs> in the Italian Alps. It's just basically it's just on the other side of Mont Blanc. <laughs> and um, yeah, unfortunately, there was only this one week in between. And then I thought, well, I will just see it as an adventure. And because I didn't know what would happen at all, I mean, it could have been that I would fail spectacularly <laughs> only like 10K in or that I could maybe possibly finish the race. So yeah, I thought, why not take it as an adventure? And I just wanted to be out there for another couple of days uh, in the mountains. So yeah, it was definitely a different approach than uh, with UTMB. Well, and it's so much, we, we often find that so much of the joy of it is just being outside and enjoying the community and and that race is such a storied race um how is recovery going so you mentioned that you didn't finish that race you were sort of doing it as an experience but how's the body feeling after after utmb yeah not too bad actually so yeah i um i dropped out of the tour at almost halfway so it was roughly 150 kilometers and actually, I was pretty surprised because like the first 100K, I was like, okay, this is amazing. I'm only one week after the UTMB and I'm running another 100K and it feels good, actually. Um, and then after the 100K, I, I realized, okay, I'm getting tired quite quickly now. And that was also the reason why I then stopped because I didn't want to yeah, dig myself a hole <laughs> basically for the next uh, few weeks. But now I'm feeling good. I think, yeah, I feel still quite tired. Um, I mean, yeah, that's had to be expected, but uh, the muscles are recovering well. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have any pain or luckily also no injury. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just basically a bit of tiredness, but that's it. Yeah. Well, this is why you're on an endurance icons podcast. You might be the very first person I've ever heard that says after such a significant race, I raced 100k and then I started feeling tired. 100 miles. Let's 100 miles. Sorry. Thank here. you for the correction. Yeah, 100, 100 miles. And then you started feeling tired after <laughs> racing the week before. <laughs> I love this so much. Now, what do you do to make sure that you recover as quickly as possible? Well, I mean, yeah, that was definitely key after UTMB um, because I. I knew that if I wanted to have any chance to <laughs> run the week after, I basically focused uh, mainly on sleep, actually. So I tried to sleep as long as possible, as much as possible. Um, then also food. So I tried to eat <laughs> uh, properly and enough, um, like especially like the first four to five days after UTMB. And so, yeah, I think sleep and food, that's like the, the main priorities. And then I saw my physio twice and he did some massage, nothing crazy because obviously the, the muscles were still a bit sore, but, um, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. So resting a lot and uh, some movement, I, I like to go swimming actually, when I do my recovery, uh, it feels really good. So some movement, but not too much. Now, do you find that after a race of that length um, and height, I guess, do you have any niggles or like your body feels like it's breaking down at all? Or I, it's just tremendous that you're able to do back-to-back -back weekends like that and have your body hold strong? Yeah, it depends. I mean, I had races in the past where I had some niggles afterwards or even some small injuries. Um, so I think I was quite lucky this year now after UTMB that it 
yeah, it had no injuries or nothing like that. Um, yeah, actually, I felt pretty good. I had a few like smaller uh, uh, problems with my feet, but nothing, nothing too bad. And after two or three days, that was gone as well. So I think now it it was pretty perfect actually. <laughs> And that was also, I, I knew beforehand that I could only do like this double if if I would feel uh, feel well after after UTMB. Mm -hmm. And I feel like to do a double like this, you also, you have to just love it. So yes. talk to us a little <laughs> bit about like how you started trail running and, and fell into this sport. Yeah, so actually that's quite a funny story because uh, when I came to Switzerland, that was like, nah, it, it's almost 10 years now um i didn't know what trail running was and i first came into contact with trail running uh via volunteering because uh, i was new here and i didn't knew so many people so then someone suggested hey there's this platform you can sign up and then you can volunteer at different sport events and there were uh, a couple of trail running events in that summer and then i was like okay trail running what's that they, they run in the mountains okay Let's see what's it about. And then I um, did a few of these events as a volunteer. And I thought those people were absolutely crazy. <laughs> I couldn't believe what they were doing because I remember that one of the very first races where I was a volunteer, I was, it was a hundred K race. And I think I was at the last aid station, kilometer 95 or so. And also towards like the second half of the field. So it was, yeah. It was also in, in, yeah, in, in the middle of the night and those people were coming there and they looked fresh and they were like, ah, oh, we are almost done and we are happy and this is so much fun. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> I can't believe this. Um, but back then I, was, I already had that idea that I needed to try it someday. <laughs> I mean, it took me two more years to finally try it, but uh, that was actually the first contact with the sport. Yeah. And what was your first race? Oh, I think my first like trail race was more like a mix between trail and road. That was a half marathon in, in Switzerland in 2016. Yeah. Amazing. And what do you love about trail running? Everything. <laughs> 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 no, I love a lot about it. I think, yeah, I think the main part for me is just being outdoors and have this feeling of freedom actually because I do it most in the mountains and they are super close from where I'm living. And I just love this feeling of running there and don't have a feeling for time or space or everything else. Like your normal life is like years <laughs> away from you. And yeah, that's, that's really what I, what I like the most, I think. Um, but also obviously to challenge myself. I mean, I do these races and I also love to do own projects where I have a crazy idea or where I try to run like on my own for 24 hours in the mountains or something like that. <laughs> and I really like that there is like endless opp opportunities, basically. Yeah. But I also I have to say that also, and that's something I only discovered, particularly this year, that I really like the trail running community. And it's a really, yeah, a really good place for me, I think. Um, yeah. Many people who think uh, in a similar direction and yeah who share this passion that's just great to see yeah and it's it's funny what you mentioned like the whole idea of using it to just like free your mind and just enjoy being outside um it was just this week I had finished uh, a day at work and I mentioned to Mark I said you know you know how some people talk about having a glass of wine and using that to unwind I said I get I feel like I get the same feeling of just going on a run like you breathe you just like exhale um, it's such an incredible sport. So you clearly love it because of how often you do it. Uh, now you mentioned swimming. Um, and I think that we have seen that you've done some triathlons in the past. Is that true? <laughs> That's correct. Yes. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about that. Is that a regular part of your training? It is actually. Yeah. So I think at the same time, when I started trail running, I also started with triathlon. Um, because it, it, it was just a great um, opportunity to get to know people because it was at the time where I moved to Zurich in Switzerland and I was new here. So yeah, it was really, really cool to go to a triathlon club and meet people there. And um, as many of them are still my friends today. 
And yeah, that was when I also yeah started cycling and swimming. And um, yeah, I think then I, I focused more on running in the beginning, but then after my first trail season, I got injured and I couldn't run basically for a whole year, which was really bad in 2019. Mm -hmm. And um, then I shifted my focus and I, because I could cycle and I also could uh, swim and I did a lot of that. And then I realized, okay, maybe my body is not, well, maybe I can't run like a hundred miles per week. That mm -hmm. doesn't work for my body or only like maybe one week per year, but not every week. <laughs> and then I tried to incorporate more and more um, those alternative uh, training possibilities into my training plan and I think today I would say actually I train more like a triathlete than a tri runner probably <laughs> interesting um, so yeah lots of alternative training yeah well I'm sure Mark will dive into your training in <laughs> a little bit later um, because yeah uh, Germans are traditionally you know triathlon powerhouses so it's <laughs> not are, it's yeah. not a surprise <laughs> um but just holding on trail running for just a, a few more moments, you came second at the Trail World Championships 80K this year. Um, and this was going into UTMB. Um, did you, firstly, did you expect to do this? And then the second is, did that change your approach for UTMB? No and no. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely didn't expect second place at the World Champs, um, to be honest. I mean... I knew that on a good day, or I hoped that on a good day, I would be maybe in top 10, top 15. Um, but I was always afraid that the course would be a bit too short for me because it was 70, no, it was 87K. And I was like, ah, I don't know if if, if below 100K, if that's yeah just too fast for me. But then it, it suited me quite well because it was so much climbing involved. <laughs> so it was actually a slow race, um, if you can say that. And um, yeah, I mean, I had a great day out there and I think I'd also, say. yeah, <laughs> and I think it was really good that I basically, I mean, I didn't really have any expectations. And I think also like the German team, they, I mean, we, we knew that we had quite a strong team, but I think that other, other people were in the focus. So there was not so much expectations on me. And then I think that really helped me to just feel free on that day and without any pressure and I just enjoyed that race so much <laughs> until the very end and yeah but it was super surprising I think for everyone including me and where was that race uh, that was in Innsbruck in Austria oh yeah that's a hilly one so like how much elevation would have been on a race like that I think it was close to 6,000 uh oh, in wow 80, <laughs> yeah ouch <laughs> <laughs> ouch ouch that but actually good... it was really helpful for me because I'm a strong climber but I'm not that fast so that was really good for me yeah it made it a longer day out there which it sounds like more time on your side the better yeah <laughs> I love it um cool let's hop into uh UTMB so I'd love to start with maybe a little bit of the kind of prep leading into it and then we could run through a little bit of like how the day itself went so you talked a little bit about kind of your triathlon training that you do there. So like in your lead up to UTMB, maybe give us a snapshot of what a, a kind of typical week looked like for you in terms of like, maybe if you can give some numbers around your running, your swimming and your biking. Yeah. I mean, I have to admit that in summer, I don't really have typical weeks. <laughs> like my typical weeks, I have them in, in, in winter and in spring training, but in summer, it's always a bit, it depends on which races I do and, and how, yeah, how I need to work or what, what yeah whatever um but now if you can be i think like a typical week in or in general a typical week in summer when i prepare for a big race is that i try to go to the mountains at least one or two days and then i already cover like 80 to 100k in, the, in those two days on feet and then i additionally do a lot of cycling mainly long rides just to get the body moving for many, many hours. Um, but yeah, I think in summer, I mean, when I peak, my peak week uh, is probably around 30 hours moving. Um, and so for example, this year with UTMB, I did something I also like to do, which is uh, go to the mountains for several days. And then I I um, ran with a friend and we did like a five day hut to hut trip. So we ran from hut to hut and it was cool because we also were at altitude. 
So it was mm-hmm. also like an altitude training and we ran each day like 40 to 50K. Um, so that was also a good, good way to accumulate the hours. And how do you find you respond to altitude? Do you, was it tough when you first started and it's been getting better or uh, how do you respond to it? Yeah, I think I respond to it quite well. I mean, it wasn't extreme altitude. So I think we were always between 2000 and 3000 meters. So could be more, but I think for me, it was it was good. And on the first day, I, I really felt it, but that was mainly, maybe also because I um, just had a food poisoning two days before. Oh. So I don't really know if it was the food poisoning or if it was the altitude. Um, but I think or I realized in the last few years that I, I tend to adapt, I think, quite quickly to altitude. So at least in this range of altitude, it works. It worked quite well. So after two days, I was completely fine. Yeah. And I know you you mentioned your training at the peak sometimes like 30 hours a week there. I think you had just finished like your PhD too. So are you like, are are you done that? And are you like working alongside this 30 hours? Or are you like full-time <laughs> ultra runner? What does that look like? No, I'm not a full-time <laughs> athlete. So yeah, I mean, it was a bit insane this spring because I finished my PhD while preparing for the world championships. And actually I handed in my PhD like two weeks before and 10 days after the world champs, I had to defend it. So oh my. <laughs> that was quite a few weeks. Yeah. What um, are you doing your PhD on? So I'm working in atmospheric and climate science and I did my PhD on climate change in the Arctic. Amazing. So, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, now I continue to work as a scientist um, part-time, but still 70%. So yeah, my main job is still being a scientist and not being an athlete. Yeah. I think that's a, an important factor for people mm-hmm. that like, man, that plays a role in how much you can recover and how much training you yeah. can get in and like, mm-hmm. oh, it's a tough balance. It is. Yeah. I mean, that was really special with the PhD because in the end it was just working and training and nothing else yeah. <laughs> now it's a bit better and also in summer i took a few days two weeks off um yeah because that was, I, I needed that i needed it a lot um but yeah now it's back to the normal normal work schedule so yeah but it works quite well i mean my my boss he's really understanding and he supports me a lot so i think that's also very special and i'm very, really happy that i can do this yeah Nice. That's cool. And do you work with a coach at all or you do your own self-coaching? Nope. Never had a coach. Wow. So are you somebody (laughs) who's always been like immersed? Like, do you immerse yourself in like learning a bunch about the science of it or what other runners are doing or um, what does that kind of look like for you? Yeah. I mean, it's basically the main reason why I didn't have a coach and had a coach for the last few years where it, I just didn't have any money <laughs> because as a PhD student, uh, you don't really earn something. And in Switzerland, it, everything is so expensive. So that was actually the main main reason. Um, but then I, yeah, I just, I think in the beginning I read a lot and I just asked people because I knew some people from triathlon and they did it already for a few years and they had coaches and then I asked them. And then I think I just tried everything. <laughs> and now after a few years, I yeah, I think I know what works for me and it seems to work. <laughs> so there, I don't really see a reason why I should change it now. Um, and as I said before, I mean, I was injured a few times, especially in the beginning of my career, if you want to call it a career now. Um, and I think that was uh, the time when I did basically each mistake I could do. <laughs> and, but I'm really lucky, or I think I'm, I'm quite lucky that this happened so early. Because now I think I, I've learned so much from these injuries. So, yeah. So other other than maybe the fact that you can't run like 100 miles a week, like you had mentioned, what were some of those other things that you that really work for you? Is it like keeping intensity low or do you have a bunch of high intensity hill stuff? What are those like core things that you know work for you? Yeah, I think I have a few core like workouts. Um, one is definitely the long run and um, I realized that for me it works best if I don't do like a a real run each time but I try to go on the trails also in winter um, and then maybe do more time on feet but less time running so I hike and I walk a lot and I realized that this uh, is much better for my bones (laughs) because I suffered from uh, stress in uh, yeah stress injuries so I realized that I don't really need to run all the time, but I can just hike for hours and that it's great training as well. 
And also I'm a big fan of hill wraps. So I, I mean, where I live, I have no mountains in my backyard, but I have like a hill, which has, I think three or 400 meters of climbing and you can do great hill reps there. So that's also one of my key sessions. Nice. And where do you base your training out of? You said you're in Switzerland. Where in Switzerland yes. do you uh, base in, out of? I'm in Zurich in Switzerland. Oh, nice. Yeah, you got some nice training options yeah. there for sure. Absolutely. So also for cycling and for swimming, it's just it's just great. And like my my every yeah day to day training is is here, but then to the mountains, it's it's one hour basically with the train, and then I'm in the mountains. Nice. So I do that quite often in the, on the weekends or also during the week. When I, because with the seventy percent, I usually can take uh, can take one day off, and then I spend that in the mountains. Nice. Um, jumping back a little bit to the triathlon there. Um, so you mentioned that you've done a bit of racing. Have you done like a, a full distance Ironman or like seventy point three? I feel like you probably went right to Ironman, knowing how much <laughs> you like the long stuff. So, what races have you done? Yeah, so I've done a um, yeah middle distance and also a few shorter ones, but I never really liked the short ones. <laughs> and actually, uh, it took quite a while until I did my first long distance, which was this year. Um, two weeks after the World Championships, <laughs> uh, I did challenge well. Oh, no way. Yeah. Really? Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, but yeah, I have to say the challenge rock was first. So because I had the slot for quite a few years now, and there was always something. Uh, first, I was injured, then there was COVID, and then there was something else. And then f- last year, I said, okay, now next year, I want to do challenge rock finally. And then they asked me for the World Champs, and I was like, ah, but it's only two weeks. But it had to work and it luckily did work and it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, how was that experience? Like what a what a first long distance race to do, like literally <laughs> the mecca of long distance triathlon yeah. racing, other than maybe like Kona, like those are the yeah. two main ones. Oh, it was it was amazing. It was always my dream to do my first long distance race uh, in Roth. Wow. And yeah, it was it was so cool. I really I I enjoyed the whole day so much. And actually I suffered a bit <laughs> then in the marathon. <laughs> Because I'm just not used to running flat for three hours. Yeah. Um, but it was great. If they had put it straight up a mountain on the run, you would have just passed everyone, including Actually, uh, Patrick Langer. I mean, there is no mountain in Roth, but there is there are a few like small essence. And um, always on the ascent, I was like, ah, oh, finally. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody else was suffering. And I felt that I was... Yeah, gaining strength on the ascent and the descent, but as soon as it was was flat again, I was like, ah, <laughs> that's not my favorite. This is kind um, of boring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, amazing! <laughs> so that's so fun. that's so cool. Did it did it give you the bug to want to do more triathlons in the future? Ah, uh, I, I mean, it was for sure not my last triathlon. <laughs> nice. Um, definitely not the last last long distance. But um, afterwards, I I also had the sense of, okay, now I can tick a box. Um, and I really uh, wanted to go back to to the trail races uh, in summer, but yeah, I mean, I'm really yeah. Many of my friends are triathletes, and I'm in a triathlon club, so there will be more triathlons. But for now, I think I will focus on the trails. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. All right, let's hop in a bit to UTMB, the actual day, uh, an exciting day for you. So maybe days leading in, kind of what was your mindset like? What were your expectations, kind of going into the race? What did that look like for you? Oh, it was exciting. I mean, it was my first UTMB. Um, so I actually didn't expect too much. I mean, I knew, especially after World Champs, that I'm yeah, up there <laughs> with the elite runners. Um, but I knew that also that UTMB, I mean, it's something different, right? So <laughs> and also the f- the field was yeah, quite good, also on the women's side. And um, yeah, I just hoped obviously for a good day and I felt confident. I mean, I was actually, I was um, in the weeks leading up to um, up to UTMB, I was sick for two weeks with a cold. Mm. Um, so I felt healthy again, but I was like, nah, I don't really know if I'm that fit. And also I couldn't train as I would have liked to. Um, so actually, I mean, my I, th- I knew that on a good day, top 10 was possible. And that was like the good day scenario that I could do that top 10. But actually when then also immediately before the race i thought i don't really think of a position but i only have a time goal in mind so i worked always with the time goal also during the race and i think that worked quite well and in the end i exceeded that time goal so that was pretty cool but yeah 
I think that was easier also for the mind that I thought, hey, I don't need to race against someone. I just race against the clock. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you mentioned that sickness in the final two weeks or like leading up to the race. I actually, I actually find with athletes a lot of times those sickness sometimes end up being like a blessing in disguise because yeah. sometimes there's those like <laughs> last bits where people are trying to like pull that last bit out of themselves in training before the race. And sometimes that like sickness actually holds you back from like going over the edge and people like look back on it and they're like, maybe that wasn't so bad for us. Do you think that might've even been the case for you? Or did you feel like that took away from you and you could have been even better if you did the, if you hadn't got sick? <laughs> no, I think actually it was a blessing. Yeah. Because it was that maybe that extra taper, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which I didn't plan planned. Um, yeah, I think it helped because, I mean, the season was already quite long for me and I knew that I had the base. I think that's always then your mind, you are worried that 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 somehow the endurance goes away. Um, but I mean, I know by now that that, I mean, that, that doesn't happen that quickly, right? Um, it was more that I, I just missed training. <laughs> I was like, oh, I want to go outside. I want to run. Um, and that was missing um and i was a bit sad about that but i think in the end with regard to utmb it was maybe a blessing yeah i mean i was not that sick that i couldn't do anything for two weeks i mean i could move i could train but yeah i mean not as i would have wanted but in the end it worked yeah and maybe yeah. i was more rested yeah exactly yeah good uh, it's a good lesson for athletes like yourself who falls in love with the training does all the base stuff yeah. like if you have those little hiccups it actually doesn't affect you and can often be a positive so just a good lesson for people and one i'm always hammering home to my athletes it's like it doesn't need to go perfect for you to have an amazing day no absolutely i mean it's always hard to believe but in the end yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's no perfect build. And sometimes the most perfect builds are the ones that end up in like weird races. Yeah. And then you're like, wait, I did everything perfectly. What was wrong there? Like, there's. No I think also it helps that you don't have too high expectations because mm -hmm. if everything works, I mean, works out perfectly, then maybe your expectations are super high yep. and then you can only be disappointed. And now yeah. I was like, wow, I don't know. I mean, I can only experience something, something positive, unexpected. And that's exactly what happened in the end. Yeah, that's cool. Like the weight takes off the mental weight of it a little bit, which is yeah. a huge piece as well. When we put too much stress on ourselves. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Some good lessons in there. Um, all right. The race itself. So give us a little rundown of like how it played out. Maybe some of your like toughest moments in the race. And then uh, when you knew you were maybe going to come second, because I think you definitely moved up a little bit during the race too. So maybe yeah. run us through the day and, and how it, how it all played out. Yeah, I think that's, how I usually race. I mean, it's not, not a tactic or something, but I don't like starting too fast actually. And at UTMB, it's notorious that people start way too fast uh, because that first like 10K section is basically flat. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to take it easy. I mean, it was already fast, but um, yeah, I think that that worked out pretty well. And then I, I was looking forward to the night because I actually like running in the night and I do a lot of night running on my own also in the preparation phase. And I felt quite confident in the night sections, also with the, yeah, there was quite some technical sections. And actually, I think the first 70K, that was really good for me. Um, I felt well and I could eat and yeah, everything was, was good. But then I think my main low point <laughs> It arrived rather quickly um, on the descent to the almost halfway mark on the Italian side at Comayor, um, because then I got some problems with my knee, um, like a runner's knee feeling. Mm. And I experienced that before in a race in, in February this year, and there it got really worse. Or it got only worse and really bad in the end. And um, I was, uh, yeah, I was afraid that this would happen again and that my race would soon be over. Um, but then, yeah, I was like, okay, just don't drop at the aid station, just try to go further. And then there was a, a longer uphill section, the flatter part. And I knew that on these parts, the knee wouldn't be such a problem. And then it improved. And then I really tried also to focus on which muscles I'm using. Maybe I could take some of the load from the outer side of the, of the leg towards the inner side. It sounds strange, but actually it worked. <laughs> um so i really focused on that and i mean i felt the knee throughout the rest of the race but it was never that bad again so i think yeah that was actually 
I was a bit lucky maybe, but yeah, it was really cool to see that, that it worked. Um, and then, yeah, I think then I realized that I'm like in fourth or fifth position. I mean, I didn't really care at that moment because I was so focused on my time goal. And I, I mean, I know these races, they are so long. So many things can happen mm -hmm. <laughs> in front of you, behind you, with yourself. Um, but then people started telling me, hey, you are um, closing the gap towards the front. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. but if this happens automatically, then I just keep keep going at my pace. Um, and I think then on the last uh, section of the course, like the last 40K, I started then catching the third and the second women. women. And that was good for me because I knew on the last part, there are these three last longer climbs. Um, and as I said before, uh, power hiking is a bit of my strength. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I could try. I think that was the only... Oh, that was only the, the 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 first moment when I actually started racing. I think until kilometer 135, I was just doing my own thing, focused on my time goal. And then people told me, hey, but second and third, they're only five minutes ahead. I was like, okay, let's try this. <laughs> and then I pushed a bit on the uphill and I uh, caught both of the girls in one of these uphills. And then there was the last uphill and then I... I experienced like my second low because oh, then no. I maybe I pushed a bit too much when I <laughs> overtook them because that was not like my race pace, but a bit a bit faster. And um, because also obviously I wanted to create a gap as soon as I've uh, overtaken them. And then on the last climb, I really suffered and I needed to reach that aid station, but the aid station was at the very top. So I was like running out of fluids and couldn't eat anymore. And I was like, oh no, I will never make it to the finish line. Um, and actually, in um, after the race, I was glad to see that Courtney suffered even more <laughs> on the final climb. So we all we all suffered there. Um, and then actually, I mean, I reached that top eight station. I I could refuel. I felt better. But then they told me that uh, the third place woman, uh, Blondine, she already had uh, catched up quite a lot of this of the time I made up on her. So she was only five minutes behind, oh, which wow. meant that like, the fast last five k down, and I just had to run as fast as possible because then I was now now I want to I want to uh, got, get that second place. <laughs> the competitive side comes out there at the yeah, end. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Only in the very end, but it was like no, now I don't want to be overtaken. I mean, before already when I was in fourth position, I was like, wow. I mean, if I could keep fourth position, it would be the fourth best fourth place ever, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it sounds yeah. like you played that perfectly though like you almost went into like robot mode for most yeah. of the race and just focused on your time goal and then it's like okay turn on the emotion when you need it at the end mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah where if you turn that on in the first 10k and run uh 35 minutes through the first 10k then you're you're yeah, walking the I mean, rest <laughs> the front people do that but i know that oh, yeah. for example i also i know that i need four to five hours until i have the feeling okay now i'm warmed up <laughs> <laughs> Now I feel feel okay in the race, so yeah, I usually usually um, try to start slow, and I actually I think I can't really start fast, so it, it helps me actually that I can't do that. Yeah, um, I I feel that as well. I feel like I'm definitely an athlete too who likes to like build within a race, but it's yeah. hard mentally to like let the race go away from you a little yeah, yeah. bit and then be like yeah. have the confidence to know it's gonna come back at some point. Yeah, you always have to need to tell yourself, hey, it's such a long race. Mm -hmm. and, and also many people at the front, they will drop. They will just suddenly don't be in race anymore. And that always happens, especially at UTMB. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, you need, I think you need that confidence um, a little bit. But then also, I think it's so motivating on the second half if you just keep catching people. Yeah. And I think the other way around is way more depressing. <laughs> yeah, be the chaser is definitely yeah. the way to go. <laughs> exactly. Um, going through the nutrition strategy a little bit for UTMB, what does that look like for you? Do you have a pretty dialed approach going into the race in terms of certain quantities you're looking to hit, or is it more just uh, certain items that you're looking to take? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so I try to, yeah, uh, reach a certain amount of carbs per hour, but uh, usually then in reality, it's not that easy. <laughs> Um, but um, I try to cover most of it with um, with carb drinks and gels, uh, but not all of it. So usually it's like um, a third of my race nutrition is drinks. 
So my cup drinks, and then another third is the gels. And then the third, third um, is solid food. Mm -hmm. And with solid food, I usually have quite a selection <laughs> with me. Um, yeah, I like to have some gummy bears, um, but then also I usually have uh, carry some potatoes with me, some like cooked potatoes um, with oil and salt, something salty. And then at the age stations, um, I usually take what I want at that moment or what I think I could eat now. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's then the, the extra calories. Um, and there it's just about, okay, if I can eat something or if something looks tasty, then just take it. Um, yeah, but usually that's how I approach it. And then, yeah, sometimes then the, the, at some point, usually the gels don't work that well anymore. And then I try to eat more other stuff. Um, and, and now at UTMB, like the last two hours, I basically survived on Coke. <laughs> yes, the best. Because that's then if nothing <laughs> works anymore and also it got a bit hot and then I was like, okay, just give me the Coke and I... Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's our, <laughs> our go to as well. Deep in an Iron Man for sure. I had way too yeah. much coke the last <laughs> while. Um, what kind? So, what kind of totals are you looking for, like when you're planning that out ahead of time in terms of grams of carbs? Because it's a a crazy long day, and your demands are going to be crazy, and you're missing pretty much all your main meals for like 24 yeah. hours almost. So, what kind yeah. of totals are you looking for? Like per hour, it's maybe between 80 and 100 grams mm -hmm. of carbs um but yeah if i reach that then that's good <laughs> yeah. usually it's not that easy to reach that goal yeah you always, also, always go ahead yeah no i also always need to remind myself that i need to eat early i need to start mm -hmm. eating early so it's yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, you always have these good totals in mind but gotta play for the the spillage or the the fall the yeah. fall off in gut fatigue or palate fatigue yeah. <laughs> exactly and if you start coke too early then you're in trouble yeah <laughs> For me, it's yeah, always like this, this. Usually, it's the second to last aid stations and aid station, and there I allow myself to drink coke, and not before. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> I always have it as a little bit of a treat for myself too. For me, yeah. it's like the last 10k is the earliest I'll get it in an Ironman of or a marathon situation. But yeah. yeah. Um. So you talked, we were talking about race nutrition and you talked about how a big part of your recovery was food. Do you have any philosophies around nutrition for your day to day, or you just eat whatever looks great to you throughout the day? <laughs> uh, no, no big philosophy. I mean, I am vegetarian. I've used to be vegan for a few years, but um, then I realized also the stress structure that maybe it doesn't really work for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I got back to being vegetarian. Um, but other than that, I mean, I try to eat healthy as healthy as possible but i'm not super strict because yeah. i know when i'm too strict that i that then it gets really tricky and that, yeah then i don't mm -hmm. enjoy it anymore and um for me i think one of the biggest learnings also is just to eat enough i think that's yeah. always tricky especially with these long training weeks and after the races and also before the races obviously um that's always tough <laughs> um because sometimes i'm just tired of eating <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so yeah i just try to eat enough and and uh, most of the time healthy but i also like some sweets and and stuff and also i like um yeah a piece of cake as a after a training session or something i think yeah so i'm not too strict with it well, I think that's important, especially with the amount of effort that you put your body through. And then in terms of recovery, you mentioned sleep is another really important pillar. How many hours of sleep would you say that you get in a 24 hour period? Like in a normal week, I always aim for the eight hours. Mm -hmm. I need the eight hours. If, if I can get more, then that's great. Uh, if less, it's not too bad. But if I have several nights um consecutive nights where I have less than eight hours of sleep I feel that um so I always aim at least for the eight hours and then if in uh, weeks leading up to a race or if I have a really tough training period or especially recovery after the races I aim for more so at mm -hmm. least nine hours and if possible then more yeah. and one of the things I love about being an athlete is that it I mean, you're constantly learning about yourself in the sport and your body's always changing. So you always are adapting. So it sounds like you made some changes from vegan to vegetarian. Has there been anything that you've changed outside of that just in as you've learned and adapted to the sport? 
Yeah, I mean, as I said before, I changed my training quite a lot because I used to run a lot, but then I got the stress factors. And then actually I realized, okay, I don't have to run that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it still mm -hmm. works out in the end. So then I changed. Uh, and now, for example, I think most of the volume I'm doing is on the on the bike, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so I changed that. Also, I changed that uh, because I realized that I need to do a lot of uh, strength training, actually. I hate it. I really don't like it. <laughs> but, um, I realized that I need to do it <laughs> because otherwise I yeah feel some niggles, uh, especially in the in the big training blocks. And now I try to be consistent with that, and also with um, like recovery tools. Like for example, I I stretch a lot, mm -hmm. and also I use foam rolling and stuff like that because I just realized okay for me it's helpful to recover quickly also between training sessions. And um, yeah, so I need to do a lot beside like the actual training, um, but I know that it's only helpful in the end and that I can enjoy like the actual training process even more. So what does your strength training look like? Um, so I try to aim for two or three sessions per week. Actually in summer, it's always hard. <laughs> <laughs> and then in summer, I'm lucky if I can get one. <laughs> But in winter, I try uh, two to three, and I usually go to the gym, um, and I use the, uh, oh yeah, all the the stuff they have there, um, and I um, always need to focus, uh, especially on my uh, like the lower back and my glutes, because I have like a scoliosis in my back, mm. so I always have this like weaker side, and I try to yeah train it such that it's more or less symmetric. Um, so I really focus a lot on that and then I do some core uh, exercises and some balance exercises which also helps with the back problems um, yeah I think that's that's about it yeah that's why you're so good on the hills because you're strong <laughs> yeah because I love hiking <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, so, much, yeah. <laughs> so you've done some absolutely incredible things your first triathlon was challenge roth you've come second at world champs you've become second at utmb what are some of the future goals and races that you have on the horizon <laughs> that's a pretty uh, tough question at the moment yes <laughs> but I, for this year i'm more or less done i mean now i have to say that since i've been a tour two weeks ago definitely the tour de Jean is now i mean it always has been uh on top of my bracket list but now it's even more um i def i'm maybe yeah i think already next year it will be maybe um, yeah one of my a races mm. because it's just the super long race and i just realized hey, I, I mean i just love being out there for even more than 24 hours so i think mm -hmm. i yeah i already really fell in love with this race um but then also i i mean i have many ideas for races I can tell you that I don't aim to do Western States soon because it's just flat and hot and downhill. Mm -hmm. So things I don't really like. But for example, Hard Rock, that's something uh, I, I really would love to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if already next year and also I need to get in first, but um, that's one of the races. I mean, I've never raced in the US, so that would be quite a nice goal to race there. Um, yeah, and I've, yeah, I've had a race in mind, but I don't really know. I mean, I've, at the moment, I don't have, for example, the goal, hey, I want to win UTMB. I mean, it would mm, be mm -hmm. nice if it would happen one day. And I'm I'm sure it wasn't my last UTMB experience. Um, but I have so many ideas for races. And I think, it, yeah, it also depends on which races go together in one season because the season is not too long and we can't do too many races. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think also, yeah, I think I'm still pretty young. Yes, <laughs> well, I would say you are. Yeah, so I hope that I have like a few years left <laughs> to do all these races on my list. Yeah. Well, we can't wait to see what you get up to. But <laughs> uh, so we invited you on because you're our endurance icon, because you say things like, oh, I ran 100 miles and then I got tired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to know who's your endurance icon. Oh, that's tricky. There are so many. <laughs> you I can mean, have more than one. More than one. Okay. I mean, first of all, Maybe that's a bit of an obvious uh, answer in the trail running community, but she is an icon for me. It's Courtney Dewalter. I mean, I I now uh, was lucky to get to know her at UTMB and I was like, 
yeah second place to her many people told me hey second place to Courtney that's basically like first place and I was like wow <laughs> he's just he's amazing and um I really yeah I really admire her because she's just doing her own thing and she mm-hmm. doesn't really care about training plans and nutrition plans and stuff like that so and she's such a grounded person and I think that's just such a cool and positive thing for our sport and also beyond the trail running community I mean she's one of the few elite athletes she's known to people who don't do trail running so I think mm-hmm. that's pretty cool um but then for example another icon he's I guess less known but uh, he's definitely <laughs> less known but um he was at the tour last week and he has won now the tour de Gion for I think three or four times it's an Italian guy he's uh, called Franco Colle and he's just he's always performing at this at this race and he has the course record there and I mean it's like 66 hours for 330k with 25-ish thousand meters of climbing <laughs> it's just crazy and um I I just um because I already dropped it for the race but I in, in the night when he came in to the finish line I hiked out to like welcome him uh, and he was still moving uh really good and he was just still uh, greeting me and it's just yeah he's just a great a great person doing this super long stuff um yeah and then there are many more i'm really i'm a big fan of zach miller for example mm-hmm. uh, because he's also just doing what he likes and loves and he's such a happy guy and he, he's always entertaining and yeah i think there are many many people like that in the trail running community i mean i always ha- I also have uh, icons in triathlon i mean as a german obviously the big german goat jan Frodeno. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's so inspiring and um, unfortunately now he had to retire, but yeah, there are many great people and I'm really lucky to be, to be part of this uh, community. Jan's got one more race coming up, apparently. Ironman oh, Israel, really? so there's one more send-off. Oh, okay. That's He's got to go out with the win. Let's hope he does Yeah, it. hopefully. <laughs> well, that's but- amazing. But what a great list. I mean, one of the things that I love about the trail community is in like you just described, it's it, the people are so down to earth. They're so uh, unpretentious. They're so connected to sort of the true meaning of what sports all about. So what a great list of icons you listed. But thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, For people who want to keep following all of your incredible adventures, where's the best place to do that? I think the best place is Instagram. Uh, my handle is a bit tricky <laughs> because it's not I mean if you google my name you will find it but my actually my handle is Galileo 1307 I was gonna say what's the story behind that one <laughs> I mean 1307 that's easy that's my birthday but the Galileo it's um it's basically back in the day when I was a tiny bit into gaming and I needed oh. like a name, <laughs> a nickname for gaming. And already there, I think I was like into science. And then, yeah, Galileo, Galilei, the big uh, scientist, he came into mind and that's <laughs> how it evolved. I love that. Now, before I let you go, what kind, which games did you play? Oh, I, everything a little bit. <laughs> there was not really a, a one, one game I, I played a lot, um, but it was just to because many people in my like it was back in school and people started gaming and then I just wanted to see what it's about <laughs> so I tried a bit of everything um, mo- mostly those strategy games I like them the most and no no war games net games or something no shooters <laughs> but now you've just moved the strategy into the race course I love it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I like oh. it more being outdoors than in front of a computer. in front of a screen oh yeah. I love it Well, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. Wow. How great was that? I always learn so much from these endurance icons. If you enjoyed the podcast as well, please consider liking us across social media, subscribing to us on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you and your support so much. We wish you happy training and we'll see you back next week.